So welcome to our second virtual lab together. I am so glad that you decided to join me for today's lab activity. And you probably actually prefer this. Maybe, I don't know, you might enjoy being able to watch these quote, lab experiments from the privacy of your bedroom or your living room or your kitchen or wherever you've decided to watch these. So if this works for you, great. I'm glad to hear it. If it doesn't work for you, sorry, can't do nothing about it. That's just the way COVID decided to treat you this year. So uh, with that said, our next lab experiment is recrystallization. And recrystallization is a very common laboratory technique uh, in organic laboratories. So this is another reason that we start off the semester with recrystallization, or at least a proper organic class should start off with something like recrystallization in the beginning. The reason general chemistry, they might mention this, you might do a very quick lab, if any, in it in the general chemistry classes. I mean, I don't know what they do. I don't teach those classes. So who knows? They might spend a whole semester on recrystallization. If so, just let me know, but I seriously doubt that they do. So recrystallization is a way that we can take a product that we have in a laboratory or a starting reagent that we have in a laboratory and we can recrystallize it, which means that we dissolve it and then we bring it back as a crystal. That is why we see re in front okay so the number one criteria here is that we have to dissolve the stuff that we're using and number two we have to bring it back bring it back folks all right justin timberlake had a song bringing sexy back right so you're going to bring sexy back in the lab and that's the recrystallization of this particular type of unknown that i'm going to give you or that we're going to do together virtually so it's got to be dissolved and then once it dissolves, we bring it back out of solution as a crystal and we filter it. And hopefully what we achieve here is that we remove all of the impurities that might be present in that sample. All right, so think of Walter White on Breaking Bad. Walter White was known for his recrystallization techniques. That's how his product was basically generally regarded and widely known and widely sought after. So you are going to be, maybe not Walter White, I hope, in this virtual lab, but you will make Walter White very proud if you end up with a very clean, pure crystal in the very end of this process. So what you're seeing on the screen here is our unknown. And our unknown, it looks like a white powder, very similar to the first lab experiment that we did together. And we're just gonna call this unknown A again because there's only gonna be one of them. And with this unknown, you actually see that the texture of this white powder is a little bit different. This truly is what maybe I would refer to as a powder at this point. I mean, I look at this thing and I almost think of laundry detergent and that's very similar to what it looks like to me. You also see these little blue specks inside of the sample. All of those blue specks should not be there. So this sample that we know is benzoic acid should be a very clean benzoic acid sample, but it's dirty. That means that maybe we didn't order the right purity grade when we brought it into the laboratory, or maybe we made this product in a lab, and this is our crude product is what we call that. So crude, C-R-U-D-E, and that crude product has to be recrystallized so we can make it better. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a dirty benzoic acid sample. It's stated there in the lab, it's letting you know what it's supposed to be, but I can visually see the contamination here, which is why we like to do this lab. So that way you can see it is contaminated. Very often, this might not be colored, and you might see this white powder, and it might look clean to you, but maybe the contaminant is a white powder as well. So there would be no way that you would know that contamination is there. 
but using this kind of bluish stuff as a visual, we know it's there and we know it ne we need to get rid of it. All right, so the very beginning of the lab experiment, I just went over to our analytical balance. That's what this is. The analytical balance costs us, us around $3,000 a piece. We have about eight to 10 of these in our laboratory facility, and they're all hooked up to a printer. So that way, when you do get a readout that's down here below on the balance, our students can actually hit the print button that is right here, and that print button will print out a receipt ticket that will have a printed confirmation um, uh, number as far as the mass goes. So what I've done is that I've teared the balance. So here I've got a weigh boat up at the very top. So this is what we call a weigh boat. And that weigh boat has nothing in it right now. It's just the weigh boat and it's completely empty. So when I did this, I put the weigh boat on the balance. I hit the tear button at the very bottom. And that made this balance read 0 0.0000 grams. Now the reason I did this is because I'm getting ready to add unknown to my weigh boat. And that way it will save me a, a subtraction. I don't really have to deal with any kind of math because if I can get this to read zero and then I can automatically add my solid inside, then that will give me a direct readout of the mass that I have added to that weigh boat. So the laboratory procedure is going to tell you to weigh out about one gram of material. So here is the mass that we have massed together. So 1.0107 grams. That is the mass of the starting benzoic acid that is contaminated. And once again, I can see that bluish tinge that's in the benzoic acid. I know it's not supposed to be there, and I know that we have to get rid of it. So here's a closer look at that benzoic acid. And what's surprising here maybe to you is that in the jar, it did look very powdery. But now that we've poured it out, and now that I've zoomed in onto those crystals, we actually see that that benzoic acid is kind of chunky. It's very rocky. Then it's mixed in with more of a fine powder that is white. And then it's mixed in with a more of a fine blue powder that's also kind of grounded up really finely textured. Okay, so all of these are basically mixed in to your sample at once. And this is a very good sign that it is crude. I do not want my product in a laboratory to look that dirty, filthy, and disgusting. We don't like filthy things in a lab, right? So I want something that looks a little bit better, a little bit prettier, a little bit more textbook. So I want you to keep this image in mind. This is what the crude product looks like. And then at the very end of this, We'll take a look at what the actual cleaned up process begins to look like. So in the lab procedure, it's going to tell you you need to get some water ready. So that water has to be heated up, and it gives you a temperature that that has to be heated up to. So what you're seeing in the picture now is just water. That's all that it is inside of a beaker, and this beaker has been placed on a hot plate in the laboratory, and I'm getting ready to turn the hot plate on. So by the time that I need this, hopefully I've not wasted any more time, and it will be at the temperature that I need. So zooming out a little bit, here is that same beaker with water and this is the hot plate that we have in our laboratory. This hot plate runs around $550 a piece. Again, just giving you some process of things in a laboratory that you might not have known. Uh, and we probably have 20 to 25 of these particular type of thermoscientific heat plates. Uh, over here to the left hand side, this is my heating. So this is me cranking up the ceramic top of the heat plate that's up here. And this begins the heating process um, right from the very start. The knob to the right hand side though, this is a stir knob. So sometimes when we use these hot plates, they have built-in stirs as well. And I can put a magnet on the inside of this beaker that has that solution, and I can turn this knob up, turn it on, and then this magnet will begin to spin around and around and around. That saves you from actually sitting there with a stirring rod or a scupola or some kind of spoon and stirring it yourself. No one wants to do that, right? If we can have technology, we use it to its advantage. So all of this requires is a little small magnet that we can put on the inside. I didn't use one here because we didn't need to stir anything in that beaker. I was just heating water. So that's why you're seeing that this is in the position of off. So I've cranked this up and I'm beginning to heat 
this ceramic top, which will then heat my water inside of the beaker. Uh, this temperature doesn't mean anything. Uh, therefore, I'm, I never want you to record that. Uh, this temperature kind of refers to the temperature of the top, not the temperature of the solution. So if I want the temperature of the solution, it's really, uh, um, I guess, um, recommended that we use a thermometer and we put the thermometer in that beaker and we measure it directly that way. We do not use ever, ever, ever use the temperature that is on the display here. That is re in reference to the top. That is not in reference to the solution in the side of the container. So in this picture, what you're seeing here is me transferring this solution over, or this sample, sorry, it's not a solution, it's a solid sample, into the beaker that's down here below. So this is a separate beaker. Uh, I've just transferred it in here because I'm getting ready to add some hot water. If I added hot water to the plastic uh, weigh dish here, it would begin to melt it and it would get really flimsy on me. So I had to transfer this material into a suitable container for that. Notice here though, on this weigh boat, you see See all this remnant stuff. All of this remnant is going to have to get out of here. All of that is product or sample that I need to transfer and I need to recrystallize that as well and I can't forget about that. So I never just want to dump stuff into a beaker like I did here and then immediately trash and throw this weigh boat away. There's stuff on there that I need. That, that is my product that maybe I worked really, really hard for and I want to make sure that all of this has been transferred over into that beaker and I'll show you how I do that a little bit later but never forget that all right so if you're in a laboratory and you're doing it on your own always go back and do successful transfers in a laboratory environment uh, here I basically took one of our vernier temperature probes I put the temperature probe inside of the solution and this probe is actually wound it up and it's connected to a LabQuest 2 device that's over on the right hand side and you'll see that in just a second but this will allow me to constantly measure and monitor the temperature of that water as I begin to heat it. I can go old school. I can use old thermometers that are alcohol based. All the mercury uh, mercury based thermometers are now out of the water and we really can't even find those too much anymore. So they are alcohol based thermometers. If I have those, I can use them. But quite honestly, this is a very simple, quick plug and play device. Plug it into the LabQuest and go about your business. All right. Uh, in the LabQuest 2 device, that thermometer is currently reading 52.9 degrees Celsius right now. The lab tells me to heat this up to 95. So I just basically let the speaker sit on the hot plate. I allowed it to heat. I allowed it to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And in the meantime, I'm not just going to sit there on my hands and stare at it. Okay. I don't need to be wasting time. So in the meantime, as this is heating up, what I decided to do is get the ice bath ready. So the lab procedure is going to talk about an ice bath. So I took a 250 mil beaker, a little bit bigger. It needs to be big enough to hold my smaller beaker in that has my sample in it. So I at least need to go bigger than that. So I did 250. And then I put some ice cubes on the inside of it from our freezer. So that's what you're seeing here in the picture. But that's not really a proper ice bath. That is just ice in a beaker. An ice bath actually adds some water to that ice. So now we have a super cold cold solution that we have ready that when we need to use it, it is there and it is cold and it's going to do the purpose that we need it to do. And that I'll show you a little bit later on. All right, so the next slide here is a video. I'm going to play this video. It's going to show you the setup of the hot plate. So that way you have a, a video and visual of everything that's going on as far as the hot plate, the lab quest, and the temperature probe is concerned. So let me play that for you, and that way you can hear my description and you can kind of see what's going on at this particular moment in time. All right, guys, so I've got my water on the hot plate, and it's heating up right now, and it looks like the lab wants me to go to 95 degrees. So I'm a little far away from that. I'm at 77. But when it gets to 95, I'm going to take the hot water off. It will not be boiling at the time because water does not boil until 100. But I'm going to take the hot water off. I'll measure it in this graduated cylinder. I need about 15 to 20 milliliters, it looks like. So I'll put the hot water in the cylinder to measure it out with. And then I will take the weigh boat and I'll rinse it out with hot water. And I'll pour all of that into this beaker 
that actually has my unknown solid on the inside with a little bit of blue speck it looks like. So that's contamination and that's the whole process of recrystallization. That's why we want to get rid of it. All right. So uh, that's the process of what I'm going to do when that dissolves all of my solid. Uh, then have a ice bath that is ready to go. So once all of that gets dissolved in the 95 degree water, once I make sure that everything is dissolved the best way possible, I might have to add one or two milliliters extra, who knows at that point, but I'm going to take that solution and that beaker, and I'm just gonna place the beaker here in ready to go. So water. I might have to add one or two milliliters extra, who knows at that point, but I'm going to take that solution and that beaker and I'm just going to place the beaker here in the ice water. So the ice water will get it cold again and hopefully my pure benzoic acid is settling to the bottom at this point that I can then filter off, recover, and reclaim. So there's my setup just in case you're interested in it. And again, it does look like I'm getting closer to 95, but not quite. So I'll take a few more pictures of the process, but at least you know my setup at this point and what I'm doing. All right, guys, so uh, here is the initial heating stage at 74.6 degrees. I'm still waiting on temperature to get up to uh, 95, which is what the lab recommends. And that 95 is based on the solubility of benzoic acid. We need it hot. We don't need it boiling. And that is why they keep referring to 95 degrees here. Uh, benzoic acid does an extremely well job uh, dissolving in hot water and hot is going to be classified at 95 degrees. All right. So uh, as I continue to heat this up, uh, you know, this is just heating water, folks. That's all that this is. So if you heat spaghetti water at home, I mean, there's no observational changes here that are surprising. You're starting to see a little bit of bubbles that show up into my beaker. Uh, as it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, not quite 95, but it is hot and benzoic acid has a higher solubility in hot water. I took some of that hot water and I squirted it inside of the way boat here. So the way boat did become very pliable on me, so I was able to fold it much, much better. But at the same time, it wasn't hot enough where it was just going to melt the plastic on me uh, or the material that it's made out of. So I just added some hot water here. I gave this a couple of swirls, and then I transferred all of this into that beaker that has my solid that needs to be recrystallized. So I took a look at my hot plate again. We are now at 95 degrees, and that 95 degrees means that that water is at this point suitable as far as temperature goes. And if I took a look at the beaker, you're starting to see more and mo more bubbles that show up, just like boiling spaghetti water would do. So I'm not at quite 100. I'm not at a boil, that by definition, uh, but I am super, super close. So due to the calculations in the beginning of the lab, we kind of have an estimate of how much hot water this is going to take. And again, it's going to be anywhere between 14 to 20 milliliters, depending on how much you weigh out. And all of that is dependent on your start weight. So my target here was around 15, give or take a little bit. I mean, this is not rocket science. I don't need to be exact. So 15 mils is what you're seeing in the graduated cylinder. So here's the line for the 10 mil mark. And then this is 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So the bottom of that meniscus is what we read. And the bottom of that meniscus is going to tell me that this is 15 mils in total. I then took that hot water and I added that hot water to my crystals. And this is basically what I saw. So I'm starting to see the, the dissolving of the blue crystal that was there as a contaminant in my product at this point. So I'm starting to see this solution turn a bluish tinge, right? And then I'm starting to see white crystal here at the very bottom. Now this is not the recrystallization stage. This is just dissolving stage. That's all that this is at this moment. So I need to continue to heat this water to 95 degrees. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, by the time I poured the water in this graduated cylinder, this graduated cylinder was at room temperature. It's going to plummet the temperature of the 95 degree water, and I'm going to get colder water by the time I add it to my crystals on this step. So I'm going to take this speaker, 
with this water and my bluish tinged benzoic acid and I'm going to put that back onto the hot plate and I'm going to heat that up until 95 degrees. And hopefully what I'll see is a completely clear solution at that point. That is what I'm after. I want a completely clear solution by the time I get there. So I didn't take any pictures of that process. I should have, but again, I completely forgot to. But over time, what happened is that this solution, as I began to heat it, completely cleared up. Um, and meaning clear, you can see through it. That doesn't mean colorless. Colorless and clear are two different words, okay? So it completely cleared up. It uh, dissolved all of the solid that was present. Even this wattish crystal in the bottom was dissolved. And then I took it off the heat and I set it onto our countertop area. As I set it on the countertop area, this benzoic acid immediately began to fall out of the solution. And this is a good thing. And the reason that it's a good thing is because benzoic acid should not be as soluble in room temperature water or colder water. All right. It's really soluble and hot. But in cool water, this stuff is going to fall out. And as you can see around the remnants of the sides of the beaker, I'm starting to see some white crystalline kind of product getting formed. I also see this white filmy stuff that's showing up on top of the beaker. That's a very good sign that my stuff is crystallizing out. But at the same time, I also see my bluish tinge solution as well. And I don't see any blue crystal. And this was one of the purposes in recrystallization. I wanted to get rid of the blue type of crystal that was there in that benzoic acid. So here's a picture of the uh, beaker and my benzoic acid a little bit further out. You can see the white crystalline layer beginning to form on the top of that surface layer. And then of course the solution, it's more evident that it is bluish at this point. So this is a very good sign that my blue crystals are staying in solution. If I just immediately put this into an ice water bath, all of the stuff would fall out all at one time. And there's a chance that that benzoic acid would capture those blue crystals again and pull it out of solution as well. So you'll always want this process to go very slow. So I put the beaker on the countertop. I just kind of let it sit out, hang out, do its thing. And then I came back like 10 or 15 minutes later just to kind of take a look at it to see the progression of it. Uh, after 10 or 15 minutes, this is basically what I saw. I'm seeing more and more crystal. But folks, look at the shape and look at the way these crystals look on the side of the beaker. They are completely different than what they started off with before, right? We said that it kind of looked like laundry detergent before. But now these are white crystals but they are very rod-like and they're very jagged and I can actually visually see those in that structure on the side of the beaker. I'm also seeing quite a bit of solid that's forming down in here, which is also a good thing. That means I am recovering the majority of my product back, but once more, I still see that blue solution that's going to be there. So I'm hoping at this point that when I begin to filter this solution, all of the blue will go through and I'll be left with just white crystal and that's it. So now that it's cool to room temp or give or take, I can at least hold it with my hand and not be burned. I'm now going to transfer that into an ice water bath. So I'm holding it up here at the very top. This ice water bath is going to cool that solution even faster and get it even colder than room temperature. Uh, and that's what we need for a... Um, a good enough recrystallization technique here. I want to pull all of that crystal out as much as possible. And if I take a look at the top of that beaker, this is what I'm going to see. So once again, it's very glossy. It's very shiny. I feel good about this recrystallization process. I see that those crystals are reforming and that they are white and there's no really blue that's lingering behind in those crystals. As I take the beaker out of that ice water, once more, I see quite a bit of white crud that is there, but I'm not going to call it crud at this point or crude product at this point. This is now a completely recrystallized product here. So I put my 
uh, basically plastic pipette into the beaker. I swirled it around a little bit just to stir it up to kind of get it agitated. And that allowed me to see those crystals even more so, as you can tell, on the side of the beaker and probably here on the side of my finger. Uh, here is the top view of that pipette edition. So again, nothing is, was in the pipette. I just used it kind of like a stirring rod, stirred it, and I began to get this slush. And this slush is a very good sign that I have quite a bit of product there. So I'm getting ready to filter this product. And the way that I filter it is that I use a filter flask. So the filter flask is actually in reference to this piece down here. And this looks like an Erlenmeyer flask or an E flask maybe to you. And it is. It is an Erlenmeyer flask that we use in general chemistry. But here on the side is a side arm. And this side arm is what makes this in particular a filter flask. The side arm is connected to this rubber hose. This rubber hose, if you track it, goes back to our faucet area that's back here. This faucet area is going to create some suction. That suction is going to pull all of my sample that I pour through the top of the funnel through the filter so that way I do not have to sit here and wait forever. It speeds the filtration process up and that is why I use a filter flask with an aspirator. And the aspirator really refers to this piece back here. It's aspirating my sample so it's pulling water through. That water is creating suction. That suction is pulling air through the funnel area and it allows me to drain off that liquid even faster. So here's just a different view of that setup. Uh, you get a little bit closer look at the Buckner funnel that's up here. I call it a Buckner funnel. Other people call it a Buchner funnel. It doesn't really matter. It's tomato, tomato. I don't really care what you say, but I've just said Buckner funnel the whole time that I've ever been in chemistry lab, and that's just what I've kind of stuck with. All right, uh, the top view of the Buckner funnel, this is what it's going to look like. There's a couple of holes in it, and of course these holes are there so that way it can drain the liquid through. But in order for this process to work, I need a good piece of filter paper. So I need to put a piece of filter paper on here to cover up those holes. That way my solid stays on the filter paper and all my liquid will drain through. All right, here's a piece of uh, a picture of a piece of filter paper that I used. Uh, it's a Wattman grade one filter paper. These are cut perfectly for the Buckner funnels that we use in our laboratory. And uh, I don't really have any overhang on it. Some people like that. Some people don't. But this is just what I grabbed that day when I was in the lab. So no big deal. And there are different grades on the filter paper because the different grades relate to the pore size. The pore size is basically how fast or how slow that the liquid is going to travel through the filter paper. So uh, I could do a extremely small pore size and that will take forever for me to filter. But in doing so, I'm ensuring that any fine, fine crystal that I need to keep does not go through that filter paper, that it is kept above and not going into the filter flask and for me to lose it at the end of this process. All right, so before I go um, and filter, I need the weight of that filter paper. So I go back to my balance. Again, I tear it out. Uh, this uh, image down here at the very bottom says 0 0.0001 gram. However, that did go to zero. I kind of caught it before it did completely tear itself out. So that was my mistake. But this is a teared balance before I put the filter paper on it. When I put the filter paper on it, this is the mass of the filter paper that we're using. And it's 0 0.2050. So that is the mass of just the filter paper only. And then I'm going to take that filter paper and I'm going to put it into the top of the Buckner funnel. Again, it fits perfect. It seats down into that funnel uh, exactly. It is made to fit. I mean, that's why we order the sizes that we do. But notice that all of the holes that were down here that you saw previous and prior to this, all of those holes are covered. So that is one of the mistakes that people do in a laboratory, that they choose the wrong type of filter paper or they don't ensure that all the holes of the Buckner funnel are covered up with the filter paper. And if you don't ensure that all the holes are covered up, then guess what, folks? You're going to be losing your product along the way, and nobody wants to do that either, right? So I'm not ready to quite pour my solution through this yet, and that's because my filter paper has to be seated. 
All right, so what does that mean? Well, that means I'm going to take some DI water in a water bottle, and I'm basically just going to squirt that water on top of that filter paper, and then I'm going to turn on the nozzle by the sink and this nozzle will allow the flow of water to start and that flow of water will come through and it will create the suction that I need in order for this process to work out for me. When I do that, this ensures that the uh, setup is working. It ensures that my filter paper has now been completely smushed against the holes and that that filter paper is not loose and can fly around and move once it's inside of that Buckner funnel. So squirting some water on it seats, and that's what I've wrote up here at the top, it seats the filter paper, or filter paper inside of the Buckner funnel so that way it is ready for you to pour your sample through. All right, so here's a video of the process before I actually start it, and it just gives you an idea of the uh, filter flask and the Buckner funnel and the water aspirator and kind of everything in motion at this point. So let me play this for you, and that way, again, you can get a video visual of what's going on in the lab. Okay, so my crystals have recrystallized at this point. I can see that inside of the flask, it looks very slushy. So that's a good sign that I'm getting crystals to reform yet again. And maybe the contamination will not reform only the crystals that I want. And that's kind of the purpose of the lab experiment. So I need to filter this. There's still a little bit of liquid that's inside of this, as you can tell. So I need to get rid of the liquid, but I want to keep the solid. And we do that by using the process of a Buckner funnel. So here's a Buckner funnel, and that Buckner funnel is attached to a filter flask, and then that's actually attached to a faucet that has cold water. The purpose of the cold water here is to create a suction. As you can tell, the water's going flowing through this way. And then this is creating a little bit of air suction through this tube that then goes into the filter flask. And that suction is going to be pulling my water through the filter so I don't have to wait here forever on my stuff to filter and dry. So what I'm gonna do in this step, I'm gonna take the slush and I'm actually just going to pour it through the filter and allow the filter to kind of do its job as far as the uh, solid is concerned. So you'll see a few pictures of that process, but here is the actual filter flask or aspiration in process. All right, guys, so after I go through and after I pour everything through that filter, I've got this beaker that had all of my crud in it, right? All of the stuff that I needed out. So I don't want, again, to leave any of that behind. So a proper transfer technique is going to have to be included here. So I've added more water into this beaker, and I gave it a swirl, and I poured that through the filter paper as well. And I did that about three times. You know, three is always kind of the go-to number in a laboratory for some reason. So after you do it a third time, you can feel kind of good that everything did get transferred over the way that it did. So here are the wet crystals that have been recrystallized. Notice how different it looks from the starting product. So the starting product was very grainy, it was very rocky, they had blue chunks in it, and now what I'm seeing is a very glossy, very shiny, very jagged looking um, um, crystal that I have in my Buckner funnel. Every time I say very jagged looking, I think of Alanis Morissette and Jagged Little Peel era back in the 1990s. Great album if you've not heard it. So uh, these crystals are basically uh, now on top of my filter paper. Uh, I allowed air to pull through that a couple of minutes just to kind of get all of the residual water that I could out. Uh, here's a close-up of uh, below the Buckner funnel into the filter flask. And the filter flask is collecting, or collecting, of course, all of my liquid that's coming through. This nozzle is not draining liquid out. It's only pulling air through, and that's where the air is going to go. Otherwise, this flask would actually explode on me if there was nowhere for it to go. So because of that, the flask catches the liquid and the air goes out of the nozzle out the side. I never want this flask to fill up with liquid, by the way. That's a disaster in the making. All right. Uh, notice that down here, this liquid that's getting poured 
through. It's not as bluish in this picture, but there is a blue tinge to that solution. So again, this is a very good sign that that blue contaminant did dissolve and stay dissolved in my recrystallization process. So that way we could remove it quite easily. Uh, here are um, another uh, is an, another picture of the the crystals on top of my filter paper. Uh, I kind of scooped them up all into the middle uh, as much as I could in preparation of removing the piece of filter paper. But again, notice the texture of these crystals. They're very fiber-like now. They're very long. Again, they're very jagged. Uh, it almost looks like cotton candy in a way if you took a look at it a little bit closer up. And then I took the scupola inside of the um, lab and I just kind of scooped it even more so up into the center of that filter paper. And I think that you can really see the texture of those crystals now. And once more, Walter White would be very proud of my recrystallization technique at this point. So after I removed the filter paper out of the Buckner funnel, I then put it on the watch glass. The watch glass, the reason I'll tell you in just a second, but the watch glass with the filter paper on it, and then you see the crystals on top of that. Again, you see the texture of those crystals completely different than what they were before. Beautiful crystals. I'm going to brag on myself in just a minute, uh, but beautiful crystals that I see here in this image. And this really is what benzoic acid is supposed to look like if it is pure. So the recrystallization process kind of worked for me at this point. I knew that it did just by physically looking at these crystals. Uh, I can automatically tell it. But these crystals are still wet, right? There's still some water residue that's going to be left behind, and I need to dry these out as much as possible. So I go over to our oven in the laboratory. We have probably six of these ovens scattered throughout our laboratory facility. Uh, these ovens typically run around three to $4,000 a piece for these basic type of models that we have and folks all it is is just kind of like an oven that you have at home with a door I mean that's all that it's going to be so this oven we use to dry our glassware when we clean it and we also use it to dry products and to dry reagents before we use them in a laboratory if needed so the on off button is going to be down here at the very bottom uh, here's a closer picture of those controls. So here's the on off button and then here's my temperature control here and I've got it dialed in about a three that's normally where we keep it and three gets me about a hundred degrees Celsius give or take a little bit. Sometimes it goes to 105 or 110 but that's kind of where it regulates itself at setting number three for us. So I turned it on it was off. Uh, I turned it up to number three that way that this thing can start heating up and getting to the temperature that I want. Uh, in the beginning, because it was off, uh, there's a thermometer in the top of the oven. You can kind of see it right here. And that thermometer allows us to kind of visualize the temperature of that oven on the inside without opening the door up. And this temperature is around 60, 65 degrees, all right, uh, at the time that this picture was taken. But right now it's at 60. So I need this to go even hotter. And the reason is because my purpose here is to drive the water off, right? And water does not get driven off until 100 degrees because that's its boiling point. So if I just put these crystals into the oven at 60 and I just close the door, my water's not going to go away. My water's still going to continue to be there. I'm never going to dry it out. So I'm just wasting time here. So I put the crystals inside of the oven, and here you see the oven rack. And the reason that I put it on a watch glass is because if I put the piece of filter paper directly on these metal rods, there's a chance that that piece of filter paper will begin to burn and char, and I do not want that to happen. So I put it on a piece of glass. That way it gave it a little bit of support so it doesn't damage the filter paper itself. So backing off from the oven, this is what the inside of the oven looks like. Here you see the bottom of that thermometer that's inserted through the top of the oven. And uh, that was the only thing in the oven at the time. So it was just me in the laboratory, no big deal. So into the oven it went and I closed the door back. Uh, a little while later, I went back just to kind of check to make sure that the oven was heating up to the proper temperature. Uh, here I'm seeing closer to 100. I don't think that I took a snap or an image of the temperature being over 100, but it did go over 100. And it went to about 105. That's where it kind of pegged out on me. 
So I left it in there for a handful of minutes after it got to the 100 mark or past the 100 mark. And I just kept it in there, just ensuring that all the water really is driven off at this point. Uh, and then I went back and took my sample out of the oven. All right, so I let the sample cool at room temperature for a few minutes. Uh, I took the piece of filter paper off of the watch glass and I took the piece of filter paper to the same balance, this time with my crystals on it, and I recorded a mass. And this mass represents the mass of the original filter paper plus the crystal that I had in the beginning, or that I have now in the very end. So the beginning mass of the filter paper and the mass of the crystal that I have in front of me at this moment. So there's going to be a question in your lab document that's going to say, well, how much in gram of product did you have in the very end? And you'll need to use these two numbers in order to be able to calculate that value. All right. So remember, we just want the mass of the crystal, not the mass of the crystal and the filter paper both. Uh, just one more image of the dried crystal here so that way you could see it a little bit closer up. Again, the shape of the crystals did not change. It was very fluffy. It was very light. It was very rod-like. It was very jagged. And those are the things that I look for for a very good crystal formation here. So again, I'm very pleased with my recrystallization technique. Uh, here in the next part of the lab, what we had to do was confirm that we had benzoic acid, and this required another melting point. So what you're seeing here is a capillary tube, of course. There's a small plug of sample that's in that capillary tube, and right now I'm putting the tamping device in through the top of the capillary and pushing it down into the bottom of the tube. Uh, here is me pushing it all the way to the bottom of the tube, and you see that plug of benzoic acid that should be cleaned up at this point. And just like before, we're never really happy with just one. So here are triplicates of that particular type of setup. So here are three plugs of benzoic acid, of the recrystallized benzoic acid, that I need to measure the melting point of. I take those capillary tubes and I take them to our vernier melt station. That's the one that I decided to use because it was convenient and it was right there in front of me. So I said, why not use it instead of the melting point Mettler Toledo 50 across the hallway. So I load all three, number one, number two, and number three samples into the vernier melt station. And then I push those into the holder. This is looking through the viewfinder. I can see those plugs. Those plugs are down here at the very bottom bottom. There we go. And once again, these beveled edges down here at the bottom, uh, that is not liquid. That's just empty space. All right. So here's a video just in case you need to see one again of the melt station setup. And I'll play this for you so that way you can get a visual image of what's happening. guys so my product has now dried in the oven it's been in there for about 15 20 minutes uh, the temperature got over 100 degrees and that's important because that's the time that water will evaporate you know if I put it in the oven and it was below water's evaporation or boiling point then it would never dry it would just the water would continue to cling on to the crystals and so forth so you probably can't really see it that well here uh, but these are the crystals that we have in the laboratory uh, I'm getting ready to put them on the vernier and the vernier is going to tell me the melting point of these crystals that I now have in front of me. So just like before, I'm going to do three, and I'm going to run all three at once, and then I'll take a couple of pictures and show you what they look like in the meantime. All right, guys, so in the beginning of this process, uh, my vernier was at room temperature, so 23.3 degrees Celsius. Uh, here's the front of the vernier melt station. Right now, it's blue, so it's in the cooling stage. I need to turn it on. So here's a picture of me turning it on and cranking the temperature up. I know that this should be benzoic acid. I know the target melting point here. So I'm going to control this knob up past that melting point just a little bit so that way that this machine can heat, but heat slowly and allow me to get a better melting point um, 
recording or melting point range. Uh, as I begin to heat this sample up, you know, here's a screenshot of 89.9 on my vernier, and I look at the crystals, and those crystals are still solid. I can see that nothing's really happening to them inside of these capillary tubes, and it looks like I put a little bit more in the third one than I did the first and the second, which is no big deal. All right, as I continue to heat more, we are now at 106.7, and at 106.7, again, here are the images that I see of the crystals. So they're still solid. They're not really melting at this point. At 115.9, I then look at the viewfinder again, and this is what we see. So these crystals are beginning to melt at this point. And I say beginning because I can still see solid plugs kind of inside of these capillary tubes. So it's not fully melted at this temperature, but it did begin to melt beginning at about 115.9 or 116 degrees. And then at 121.9, what I see is finally all of the crystals just completely dissolved at this point. So everything is liquid at this temperature. This would be my kind of final temperature that I would want to record. I could record this as my melting point temperature if I want because that truly is when everything melted in my capillary tubes. Or I can take 116 and 121 and I can do an average of those two numbers if that makes you happier. So that way you have a beginning and a end range and the middle is going to be your melting point. Some people do that, some people don't, but that's your personal preference. Whatever you want to do, I don't really care. All right, so finally, here is that image of uh, 121.9. So uh, there's your crystals, folks. Uh, there's your recrystallization technique. I'm glad that you helped me out in this process. Uh, so uh, you now kind of are aware and have some understanding of recrystallization. You now know the purpose in us doing it in a laboratory, and you now know how we confirm if something did truly get recrystallized at this point. Uh, and how we can prove it in a laboratory setting. So on your laboratory document, this is what you're going to see. I'm going to zoom in a little bit for you. Uh, the procedure, once again, is going to be on the couple of pages. You can read through that. It's basically everything that I showed you at this point. And then the data table is what you would need to scan and upload into the Blackboard system. So with the Experiment 2 data table, question number one says how much hot water was calculated and needed to dissolve one gram of benzoic acid. And it says the solubility can be found in the lab procedure. So if you go back up to the lab procedure, that question is actually in step number three. So it, this is where it gives you the solubility, 68 grams of benzoic acid for every one liter of uh, water at 95 degrees, and that's what they deem as hot water. Okay. Uh, question number two, it says, please complete the table below. What was the mass of the sample that you had in the very beginning? Then the next box, what's the calculated volume of water needed? Well, this is not the same answer from question number one. This is based on your amount that you actually used in the experiment. So yours is not going to be 1.0000 exactly. So they want you to do that calculation again that you did with question one, but they want you to use your actual mass that you used in the lab to do this with. So once you do that calculation, that's the new number that goes there. Mass of the filter paper, you now know what that was. I showed you an image of it. Mass of the filter paper and the product, you also know what that was. I showed you an image of that as well. And then mass of the recrystallized product only. So once you take the difference of the filter paper product and then the filter paper, that will give you the mass of just the product. And that's the number that needs to go there in that box. Uh, part two is the melting temperature. So the melting temperature of benzoic acid is going to go here. And then a couple of questions here at the very end of the lab. Number one, draw the structure of benzoic acid below. What is benzoic acid's theoretical melting point? So I'm forcing you to draw another organic chemistry structure. We're going to have to get used to that. And then writing down the melting point theory probably can come from somewhere like Wikipedia. Uh, is the molecule ionic or covalent? That is a question that you need to answer. And if you don't know the definitions to ionic or covalent, you can probably find those in the lecture videos. Is the molecule inorganic or organic? Again, if you don't know the definitions of these, you can find those in the lecture videos as well because we've talked about them. Since the molecule is soluble in water, is the compound polar or nonpolar? 
Once more, polar and nonpolar can be found in the lecture videos. We've talked about it. We've discussed it. You did some assignments on it. So you should be able to make that decision here pretty easily. Question number two says calculate the percent recovery of benzoic acid, which means how much did you end up with? All right. So we know that you're going to lose stuff. In a laboratory, we know that you are going to lose things on transfers. There's just no way around it. That's just the way that it's going to be. None of us are perfect. So this is a way that we can report how much we actually recovered back. And we can kind of use this number to maybe determine the amount as far as contamination goes. So calculating the percent recovery of benzoic acid, they want me to take my recrystallized weight that I had in the very end. They want me to divide that by my starting weight that I used in the very beginning. And then they want me to multiply by 100. And the reason is because there's a percentage here. Okay, so when I do that calculation, whatever number I get, that's the number that goes here. I'm going to go ahead and tell you in organic chemistry, about a 60% recovery is pretty good for us. Uh, this is not like general chemistry. Organic chemistry, there's so many side reactions, there's so many transfers, there's so many things that we have to do in a lab that we are going to lose it. And we're going to lose not quite half, but we're going to lose almost a third every single time that we do an experiment. That's just the way that it is. So any time that you can get around 60 percentage or greater, then you are doing pretty well for that lab technique. So let's see how good we did together. And we'll do that calculation. And you can put that answer there in question two. Number three, it says, suppose your percent recovery was greater than 100. OK, so what this means is that you have more in the end than what you started with. All right, so how can even that be possible? Okay, how can you have more mass in the very end of this process than you had in the very beginning of the process before you did anything to it? So think about a reason that that could happen and write your answer there. Question number four says, suppose your percent recovery was lower than 20. All right, so this is really bad. That means this was lost tremendously. So how bad could you have messed up in order to lose that much product. What could have been an error? What could have been a step that you messed up on? That's going to be the answer to number four. Number five and number six, these can be found in the background information. What are some of the properties of an ideal recrystallization solvent? I mean, why did we use water here? Why didn't we use something else? And is water allowed to be used every single time for everything that we do? And of course, the answer to that is no. So how do I go about choosing a proper solvent for me to use in the recrystallization technique? And then number six said, why was ice cold solvent used to rinse the purified crystals? So why did we want to make sure that it was super cold before we took that squirt bottle to those crystals and gave them a good rinse in the very, very end? Number seven, if the hot solution was immediately placed in an ice water bath, what could have happened as far as mass goes? and what could have happened as far as melting point goes. Remember, I kind of briefly mentioned what would happen if you immediately put it in the ice water bath. So how would that affect melting point and how would that affect, affect your mass if that was what happened? Number eight and number nine. Number eight says, is the percent recovery within an acceptable range? And this is 66% plus or minus five. And then number nine is the melting point within an acceptable range. So you know what the melting point for benzoic acid should be. Are we within plus or minus 3% of that value? And the answer is either yes or is it no. Uh, so those are all calculations that you can do here on the very end of the lab experiment. All right, so this lab video was a little bit longer than the previous one. There were a little bit more steps that were involved in the recrystallization, and there were some more images that I had to show you for this process. So that is the story for recrystallization. I'm glad that you did the lab with me today. And uh, I think overall, looking at the data, I think you did pretty good. Uh, so with that said, go ahead and fill out those questions. Again, scan it, upload it into the system, submit it for grade. And once more, I think that you'll earn a very easy A on this lab experiment. But only if you actually do the work and turn it in for me to grade. So make sure that you do that every single time with these labs. Don't let these easy grades pass you by and really do a disaster to your overall average. 
All right, so until next time, uh, that's where this lab video is going to end. And the uh, next lab will actually be even more complicated than this one. So again, we're building up, just like we do in lecture. So uh, welcome. You are now finished with the recrystallization. So bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Uh, make sure you don't think about me too much before the next lab comes around. And if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me.